The Trumpet Daily with Stephen Flurry. Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to the Trumpet Daily radio show. Lots to get to on today's program. I'll, uh, just a quick programming uh, update here. Friday show, I think we had a record number of uh, people listening in to the, the live stream, uh, a couple hundred through the, the video stream, and I think 150 or so through the audio stream, and, and then who knows how many uh, over the air there in uh, North uh, Edmond. Uh, but that's uh, in addition to uh, everyone that listens to it as a podcast later, uh, which I think is uh, the majority of our audience. So in any event, it is uh, uh, exciting when you can get uh, a live presentation, particularly when there's so much going on in uh, the world. And Friday was uh, was definitely a big news day with uh, the killing of uh, Suleimani. Uh, the, the evening before. We'll have uh, quite a bit more to talk about on that subject here in just a, a little bit. But regarding that show Friday, a few uh, comments uh, as they came in. It says, uh, you're good at this news broadcasting, and this should be number one, the, the number one news broadcast channel. So we're, we're far from that, obviously, with our uh, small number of faithful listeners. In any event, uh, we do have a small group that's very appreciative of KPCG and the Trumpet uh, Magazine, the website, Key of David, and so on. Another one says, this is great, hearing the latest news so immediately and making it so relevant. Impressive. Thank you. Uh, Another one says, fantastic news and information. I turn to you first for news these days. Another one here says, barely three days into this new decade... And the world is on the verge of changing dramatically. Another short one here says, Hiya, must be from the UK. Hiya, I think things are accelerating fast now, it says. And then this one, a little bit longer, it says, Just want to say thank you for the great service that this program provides to myself and many other listeners that tune in to the awesome work. Your message is so uh, refreshing, it says, and enlightening to the spirit. God is certainly blessing. Uh, the PCG, enlightening to the Spirit, he says. Um, it says, I remember when I first heard Mr. Armstrong's sermon on a Sunday evening, um, that was uh, September of 1985, I was shocked. I had never heard a strong message like that. So that's some uh, some feedback that we got over the weekend, which is always uh, good to get. You can send in emails too, if you like, or uh, send in uh, comments on the social media sites, but if you'd like to email us, you can email us at td at kpcg.fm. Well, when you look at uh, the fires that are raging in uh, Southeast Australia, you're, as we've written before at the Trumpet, you're hearing all of these terms, unprecedented and and record-breaking, or these history-making events, and these are tragedies, these are disasters that really should concern us. What is happening? As someone commented there, we're just a few days into the the new calendar year, and everyone goes in, it's a big party, there's fireworks, lots of drunken revelry to go with it, but kind of a hopeful, optimistic outlook for 2020. And yet, what is the reality? Well, look at these fires that are raging, and people are demanding action. All the uh, actors and actresses at the the awards show last night, quite a few of them, say that we need to save the planet. It's all climate change in their minds. Russell Crowe, he's an Australian that, I guess he didn't make it to the... uh, the award show, but he sent a message and said, all these fires, it's all connected, it's all related to climate change. Climate change, and I think it was Joel Hilliker in the latest, actually it's a month ago now, the Trumpet Magazine, the January edition, this month's edition, it says, those who attribute these disasters to the supposed sins of omitting, uh, emitting carbon, eating meat, and having children rather than the actual sins that God defines in his word, 
are directly contradicting and defying God's truth. People are happy to talk about the sins of mankind with respect to carbon emissions, with respect to having too many children, with respect to eating meat, perhaps. But what about the sins that God defines in the Bible? Well, even with respect to these raging fires and the oppressive heat over the weekend, I think it was 49 degrees Celsius in Sydney. That's, uh, that's about 120 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> that's, that's oppressive heat. And listen to this from the Daily Mail. It says, Sydney police hunt arsonists who deliberately started bushfires threatening 100 homes on the city's hottest day ever as the mercury hit 49 degrees Celsius. So they're looking for arsonists who are believed to have started these fires. All these hot conditions with what the celebrities talk about that. The globe is getting hotter. But why don't these stories get more attention? These are human beings that want to burn their country. It says horrific fires, which threatened to destroy 100 homes in Sydney's west, were started deliberately by cruel arsonists, locals say. A police manhunt is underway to find the culprits who allegedly started two blazes. Two blazes. George's Hall and, and Badgerys Creek, it says. It comes as ma- a massive bushfire in Sydney's southwestern outskirts is threatening to break containment lines and reach suburban areas. There's some places where the burning is just a few meters away from houses. Homes are going up in flames. I think there's um, some, something like 28 or 29 people that have already been killed. In this curse, that's what it is. It's a curse. And then there was this tragedy about all of these dead animals. This local, I forget exactly where where this is from or what region, but he's just driving along the road and 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 pointing out all of these. We have a video of it actually, clip one. It's pointing out all of these dead carcasses. Clip it's heartbreaking one. to come along here and. The fence line's just littered with animals that have tried to get out and uh, they've broken through the fence here trying to get through and look at this, it's just, it, it's disturbing. It is really, really disturbing. That is just such <coughs> a waste, um, you know, that's just terrible. Like, where could they have gone, these animals? They're <coughs> nowhere for them to go and uh, now they're just littered on the side of the road and uh, they're everywhere. It's very sad. The Sun here in the UK is estimating that there could be up to a billion, a billion animals, including insects and all of that, a billion animals dead because of this, this curse. It says it comes as, this is the Sun, it comes as 24 people were killed and 200,000 homes were destroyed in the horrifying uh, bushfires. Sydney was declared the hottest place on earth yesterday, with temperatures rocketing to nearly 50 degrees Celsius as fires continue to rip through the area. It says experts fear a billion animals, including mammals, birds, reptiles, frogs, and insects, have perished in the bushfires. This is according to Sky News. Speaking to broadcaster Stuart Blanche, in Australia, he said many animals were well adapted to cope with bushfires, but the current blazes were too big and too hot to escape. And so you have scenes like what we just showed you on video. There's another article here from the Wall Street Journal saying that the fires are so hot they're generating thunder and lightning. Listen to this. It says wildfires ravaging much, much of southeastern Australia burn so hot that they created their own thunderstorms and lightning, similar to conditions during a volcanic eruption or atomic bomb blast, like a, like a nuclear cloud, basically. It says instead it was fire that rained down. Well, people who thought there was a, a, a storm, it says instead there was fire that rained down from the formation of 
well, some kind of a cloud formation. It's a long scientific word I'm not familiar with. It says, created by intense heat driving air rapidly upward in the smoke plume from a wildfire. Well, it's just describing this process, this phenomenon. Again, things that we're just not seeing, that we haven't seen before. Chapter 9 of my father's booklet, the Isaiah booklet, he refers to a verse in uh, Isaiah 29, 29 and verse 6. It says, You shall be visited of the eternal of hosts with thunder and with earthquake and great noise and with storm and tempest and the flame of devouring fire. That's Isaiah 29 and verse 6. God says you're going to be visited with this. A devouring fire. These fires are devouring lives. They're devouring animals. They're devouring the landscape. And we should be concerned. And we should be asking hard questions. And we should be talking about sin. Russell Crowe can send his message to the award ceremony, and everybody applauds him, but if you get, there was the example, remember, of the rugby player who came out and said, well, these fires are happening because of our, our sins, sins as the Bible defines them. And he was ridiculed and mocked and persecuted for saying something such as that. Why can't we just look at what God says? Why can't we accept what God says about the weather, about the devouring fires? We should be asking questions like, why is this happening? Why is it worsening? You know, last, and I don't want to take anything away from the seriousness. You can understand why the seriousness of this curse, I mean, you can understand why it's gotten a lot of coverage on, on the news here, but following the, the targeted killing of uh, Suleimani and um, those others that were with him, I just flipped on the news Friday morning here in the UK, the BBC and then uh, Sky News, and I did it like two or three times that day because I just I wanted to see how it was being covered here in the UK. Now, I must have just missed it because I'm sure it was covered. It was huge news. But it was just, it was frustrating to me that, that two times when I turned it on and flipped to both channels, I think in the course of uh, maybe 12 hours, the few times I checked in, I saw three segments about not just the fires in Australia, but about climate change. Sky News as well. That gets all the headlines. Where was there a, a celebrity last night talking about the arsonist? Throwing down a match in 120 degree temperatures. That shows you something about the the nature in man. We do have problems. We do have some sins that we need to be thinking about. It's a pity. It's a shame that we're not considering, as is brought out in the January trumpet, that we're not considering the actual sins that God defines in his word. Mr. Hilliker said, the focus on climate change hides the real issue. If human carbon emissions aren't causing floods in Venice and droughts in Australia, then what is? To be sure, he he says, human activity does directly cause some nature-related problems. He, He talks about acid rain and so on. But there is yet another far more germane factor to consider regarding the cause of disasters. It's spiritual. That's in his article, The Unseen Consequences of Climate Change. It's in the January issue of the Trumpet magazine. It'd be a good one to pull off the shelf and review, whether you're in Australia or anywhere. Of course, we have our booklet, Why Natural Disasters?, that's also got some, some important content as well. One last, uh, one last bit I can refer you to. The, of course, the little book booklet is not so much about disasters like we're seeing, but there is one statement in this booklet that I want to draw your attention to. It says, natural disasters have intensified mightily since Mr. Armstrong died. He died, of course, in 1986. We know this. 
There have been earthquakes, floods, droughts, and fires, my father said. There has also been an alarming increase in family breakdown, race problems, and out-of-control crime. Let's talk about our sins. Let's talk about actual sins that God defines, not human beings, but the sins that God defines in his Bible. It says it's also true for the British people. South Africa has lost control of its country, that catastrophe, and a lot more. It says it's gonna, a lot more of this is going to happen in the United States and Britain if we don't heed God's word. Then he says this, Get your mind conditioned for catastrophes as never before on this earth. What a statement. Get your minds conditioned for this. You better get ready. My father wrote that booklet back in the, the 1990s. This is a, an older booklet. Following the death of Herbert Armstrong, written and produced in the 1990s, and look at where we are. These fires just destroying, destroying so many of these areas, in and around cities, by the way. What's the cause? Why is it happening? Well, we also have the trend article at our website, thetrumpet.com. Why the Trumpet Watches Increased Natural and Weather Disasters. We certainly do watch. We certainly do watch and pray, as as Jesus said that we should. This is the time when many people in Australia should be waking up to the truth and considering, considering themselves, looking at themselves, and looking at what God says about our actual sins. Well, the other, as I say, the big news, the big story from the end of last week, the one that I was uh, looking for on Sky News and the BBC, just all of the the uh, reaction to the killing of uh, Qasem Soleimani and his, I think the the man that he was with, uh, Mohandas, I believe. I forgot. I have his name here later in my notes, but um, but he he uh, it seems like was the top official over so many of these uh, Iranian or sorry Iraqi militias that are obviously pro Iranian. So these were two big shots that were removed, that were eliminated, and the fallout from that. The liberal media, of course, is making much of it. Iran, for its part, is out there saying there's going to be lots of carnage in, uh, in response. Yesterday, I believe it was, the, uh, the parliament in Iran, they were all chant- uh, chanting death to America. This, ha- this is not unusual, by the way. <laughs> you can see the, the video there on, uh, on the YouTube stream. They see America as the, the great Satan. That's the, way they, that's the way the leaders have seen America for 40 years. Now, as I said Friday, there's a lot of ordinary Iranians that are happy about what's happened. But the ones that are out front, the ones that are supportive of the mullahs, the regime, they're the ones that the media fixate on at times like this. Iran announced yesterday that their nuclear program will have no limitations in production, including enrichment capacity. That's a, an official statement from the Iranian government. Now we're going to build now we're going to build a bomb. They w- they weren't doing it before. They they were complying with the nuclear agreement. And that's what they want for us to believe. That's what the liberal media wants for us to believe. The New York Times says the consequences of the American killing of the top Iranian general rippled across the Middle East and beyond on Sunday with Iran all but abandoning a landmark nuclear agreement. That's the New York Times. As if they weren't, as if they were totally in compliance, totally complying with this landmark nuclear agreement. That's the way they view it. They're right in step with Ben Rhodes. The same mindset. Here, I'll read to you what Reuters reported. 
about all of these attacks that led up to this strike, this response from President Trump late Thursday night, early Friday morning. Yesterday, the Iranian regime offered an $80 million bounty for anyone that takes out Donald Trump. (laughs) So lots and lots of rhetoric, including coming from the president, President Trump, tweeted out that that he had pinpointed 52 targets in Iran, including cultural sites. And he came up with 52 because that's how many uh, hostages they took in 1979. (laughs) That's President Trump, some 40 years on, reminding them that I've picked out, you took 52 hostages, now I've picked out 52 sites. And here again, the media... In America, they're up in arms. Well, you can't, that's not, that's not downplaying this, or that's not pulling back. That's not, you know, dialing it down a notch. You're making it worse. He was on board uh, Air Force One last night with some reporters who questioned him about, you know, him bombing cultural sites. He said this, they're, they're, allow- they're allowed to kill our people. They're allowed to torture and maim our people. They're allowed to use roadside bombs and blow up our people. And we're not allowed to touch their cultural sites. It doesn't work that way, he said. (laughs) That's not the way it works. They can do anything they want, even to Americans. And all of you people in the media, you could care less if they take out a U.S. contractor. That's just just, uh, an ordinary event in Iraq. We just have to get used to that. His reference, by the way, to the 52 uh, hostages, um, it made me think of this article. Richard gave me this over the weekend. It's uh, one that my father wrote back in 2014. What what should a nation do when it's treated with contempt? (laughs) Here's some, some pretty good advice coming from God's servant. Back in 2014, he, as my father opens the article, he talks about the... uh, the uh, hostage crisis from 1979. It went through all the way to the the first month of 1981, 444 days. These Americans held hostage while a weak, inept government in the United States could not do anything to free them. And all of these Iranian mullahs just, just... reveling in the the thought of mocking and ridiculing the great Satan, the United States of America. My father in this article refers to the example of David and Goliath and how that David approached the battlefield and and saw all of these these Israeli or sorry these Israelite soldiers cowering in fear, paralyzed by inaction. They, they, they did not want to stand up to this, this giant. And of course, you know what David went and did. He said, who's going to remove the reproach? That word means contempt or vile dishonor. Who's going to take away the contempt that this giant is showing for the armies of the living God? These are God's armies after all. David, uh, took it upon himself. He, uh, he acted in faith. My father said this, nations all over this earth routinely despise and taunt the United States regardless of America's superior strength. There's no respect or fear of the U.S. Where is the David-like leader to stand up and defend the honor of the nation? Who in America would stand up and fight for the honor of their nation or even the honor of God? Even America's valiant soldiers are restrained by disgraceful and incoherent policies from the top. Again, he's writing this back in 2014. This was like right in the middle, I guess, of the Obama presidency. But he says, David stood up himself and removed the dishonor from Israel, just as on the human level, America ought to remove the dishonor created by Iran a long time ago. And by so many other nations today, America ought to remove the dishonor. 
Here's this terrorist, as I said on Friday. He's just, he's just hopping all over the Middle East like he owns the place. In Damascus, in, in Lebanon, over in Tehran. Then, then he's landing in Baghdad. He's there. He's there to continue the jihad against the United States. This was just hours, hours after it died. The, the attack on the U.S. embassy died down. 48 hours, the embassy of the United States under siege. And then it uh, dies down once President Trump sends in reinforcements, more troops. But here comes Soleimani, and he had another attack. That's what Secretary of State Pompeo was saying on Friday. Same with uh, President Trump. Another attack was imminent. So the U.S., acted, and took him out. Oh, there goes a fly. Boy, he's having a good time. (laughs) He's stuck in our little light up there, Sam. Maybe he'll burn. Well, we don't want to see another animal burn, though. (laughs) Come on now. Anyway, the Iraqi parliament, yesterday they voted to, uh, to expel the U.S. forces in Iraq. Now, it's interesting what is said publicly, and these are mostly uh, the Shia members, the, the Kurds, those representing the Kurds and, and the Sunnis, they want the United States to stay there. In any event, they, go, they, they make a big show of this vote. It's a non-binding resolution that's, that's calling for the expulsion of American forces. There's about 5,000 U.S. forces in uh, Iraq today, some 17 years on from the invasion back in 2000, uh, 2003, we th- I think we have about 1,000 or so in, uh, in Syria. So we don't even have that many troops, but there is a massive embassy that we've constructed there in Baghdad. I think it's a sprawling embassy and compound of like 100 acres or so. There's a huge military base funded by the United States. And so President Trump yesterday, he said, we're not going to, they've called on us to leave. And he says, we're not going to leave unless they pay us back for that base. Billions and billions of dollars. And then he went on to say that, that if you're going to give us any problems, we'll slap sanctions on you that uh, are even worse than uh, what we've put on Iran. So it's a lot of talk back and forth. But anyway, Secretary Pompeo said on Friday, well, I I see some of the public statements that Iraqi officials are saying, but I also know what they said privately. (laughs) In other words, uh, there's a lot of people that are quite happy that uh, Soleimani is gone. Listen to this Reuters piece, though. It says, in mid-October, Iranian Major General Qasem Soleimani met with his Iraqi Shiite militia allies at a villa on the banks of the Tigris River, looking across the U.S. at the U.S. Embassy complex in, uh, in Baghdad. It says the Revolutionary Guard commander instructed his top ally in Iraq, this is uh, Muhandis is his name, this was the one that was also killed in that strike Thursday night, Muhandis and the other powerful militia leaders to step up attacks on U.S. targets in the, uh, the country using sophisticated new weapons provided by Iran. Two militia commanders and two security sources briefed on the gathering told Reuters. It says the strategy session, which uh, has not been previously reported, came as mass protests against Iran's growing influence in Iraq were gaining momentum, putting the Islamic Republic uh, in an unwelcome spotlight. So all these Iraqi citizens are protesting that they're being dominated, their country, their parliament, they're being dominated by Iran. We want want the Iranians out, they were saying on the streets. Uh, uh, Soleimani's plans to attack U.S. forces aim to provoke a military response that would redirect that rising anger toward the United States. So it was all carefully calculated and planned. Soleimani, he saw what was happening on the streets. He understood the Iraqi sentiment. He said, hey, we've got to do something here to make them see that, it, that it's the United States that's the bad guy. So they were provoking the U.S. in hopes that the U.S. would lash out at them. Well, that's what led up to the attack a week and a half ago. 
the bombing raids and then uh, retaliation surrounding the embassy, burning down the walls or trying to burn down some of the compound. It says here, two weeks before the October meeting, Soleimani ordered Iran, uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guards to move more sophisticated weapons, such as Katusha rockets and shoulder-fired missiles that could bring down helicopters. So they were moving in these sophisticated weapons into Iraq so that they could, so that they could attack these U.S. positions. It says, Soleimani told, this is further on, Soleimani told, uh, told them such a group would be difficult to detect by the Americans. Well, he ordered the formation of a new militia that would not be detected. It says here, before the attacks, the U.S. intelligence community had reason to believe that Soleimani was involved in late-stage planning to strike Americans in multiple countries, including Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, U.S. officials told Reuters Friday on condition of anonymity. So here they were getting more and more of these weapons. Another attack was imminent. You hear all these people talking about a tweet that escalates, supposedly escalates the tensions. Who has escalated the tensions in Iraq these past several months? Well, it brings us then up to date. The U.S. going after those those uh, Iranian positions, and then they surrounded and, and besieged the embassy. And then late last Thursday night, the attack that killed Soleimani and uh, Muhandas as well. The Telegraph, it says here, in the wake of the death of Qasem Soleimani, Iran is on the back foot. It's been a real setback for the Iranian regime, and this article talks about this popular mobilization front, this uh, Iranian militia group in Iraq that, uh, looking at its Twitter account, following the killing of Soleimani, there were some strange statements, there were delays. In, in other words, it's just pointing to a few examples showing that they were really rocked by this, by this attack, by this targeted killing. It says uh, in this Telegraph piece, Iran watchers have, have uh, commented that Muhandis, he was the one leading the militias in Iraq, who was tremendously loyal to the regime, was the thing that con uh, connected the different groups under the PMF uh, umbrella, having created several of them. It says the group will recover, but right now it is wobbling. Right now, the Telegraph says, Iran is on the back foot. Its greatest military commander has been killed, and its primary means of retaliation cannot be relied upon. Right now, they're on the back foot. This, like I was saying Friday, this represents a, a major strike on Iran's ability to lash out with more terrorist attacks. Now, they'll resume at some point. And, and maybe more attacks are imminent, but right now they're scrambling to try to get leadership in place. I think another point that, that needs to be made here, too, is that, uh, well, this was in today's New York Times piece. It says, in general, the Europeans did not specifically criticize Mr. Trump for his decision and share, it says, they share the American view that Iran has been, has been a destabilizing force in the Middle East, and a supporter of terrorism. They share that view. Their response, there have been some reports, Boris Johnson was shocked and upset that, that, that they didn't know ahead of time. But besides that, they haven't really criticized taking out Soleimani, at least not loudly, because they share the view that he was a destabilizing influence that Iran is a destabilizing influence. And I think another, another point that needs to be made here right now, it's the U.S. out front, but we know from Daniel 1140 that soon it's going to be the European, the European beast power headed by Germany that's going to be out front, confronting, confronting this king of the south, confronting radical Islam, confronting Iran. And so they are watching, they are observing 
in the heart of Europe. They're observing everything that's happening here. And soon they're going to be a main player themselves. If you even look at you know, some of the fiery rhetoric, the Iraqi official saying this, or, or, or the Iranian parliament saying this, President Trump's response, well, if you do that, then you know, you've got 52 sites that we're going to take out or bomb. But if you look at the actual boots on the ground, 5,000 in Iraq, 1,000 in Syria, that's not that much. That's not that much of a, of a U.S. presence. It's enough to go up against a militia. It's enough to take out the kingpin if he just lands, brazenly lands about, uh, what was it, a half mile from the U.S. embassy? He comes flying into Baghdad? He thought he was untouchable because George W. Bush wouldn't touch him. Barack Obama wouldn't touch him. They had their opportunities. And I think even early on, President Trump wouldn't touch him until he crossed that line, that red line, killed an American, injured others. And so he retaliated. But listen to this. I think this is clip six. It's later in my notes, Sam. But this is uh, President Trump on Friday talking about this attack. This is fresh after the attack. He's given a speech, I think, down in Florida. But this is uh, the president the other day, clip six. We do not seek war. We do not seek nation building. We do not seek regime change. But as president, I will never hesitate to defend the safety of the American people, you. So let this be a warning to terrorists. If you value your own life, you will not threaten the lives of our citizens. That's President Trump on Friday saying that we're not seeking war. We're not we're not interested in nation building. We don't seek, we don't even seek regime change. It's just that if you put our Americans under threat, that's when I'll respond. Now that's, that's a red line, as I said Friday, and he, he definitely responded. He acted. But that is not, that is not a position that really is serious about increasing the influence of the United States in the Middle East. You can almost look at this president and some of the things that he says, and say, right now he's saying, if, we, if you ask us to leave, then you better pay us back for this, this uh, base we built here. But depending upon how all of the details play out, you could, you could see a president like this with the positions he has saying, fine, if you don't want us there, then you fight Iran yourself. In any event, what we know from Daniel 11 and verse 40 is that when that spectacular clash happens, the United States is not even, they're not even mentioned. We're not even a main player. And we're not even that far removed from that if you just look at the numbers. Right now, though, like my father said in that 2014 article, if you just have, if you just have a little bit of pride in your power and you're willing to use it, Look at, look at what you can accomplish. Look at how quickly you can remove contempt, dishonor, reproach, as it says in that account between David and Goliath. Well, when we come back, there's a few other <coughs> clips and uh, I think a couple more points that we can make with respect to uh, the war of words, not just between the, the Trump administration and uh, the Iranian regime, but the Trump administration and the former Obama officials. There's quite a war of rhetoric going on between those two camps as well. You're listening to Stephen Fleury, and this is the Trumpet Daily Radio Show. If you'd like to email the program, you can send comments to td at kpcg.fm. We'll be right back. This is KPCG-FM, and this is the Trumpet Daily. Throughout the Bible, God uses his material creation as a vital instrument through which he communicates with mankind. The scene is nothing short of apocalyptic. We have nothing, nothing left. The so-called natural disasters we see increasing are, in fact, 
a tool that the creator of the natural world has reserved for himself to use in order to speak with us. We have been praying for quite a while now for the eye to pass over so we can get some kind of a break. Severe natural phenomena are impossible to ignore. Yet for most people, even as our planet is coming apart, the message is still not resonating. Tonight, along the Texas Gulf Coast, utter devastation. In the town of Rockport, entire blocks are decimated. The question is, are you prepared to listen? You know, this, this is of biblical proportions. Fred, take a look around me. Our town is destroyed, and uh, it hurts. Jesus Christ listed nature-related disasters as being a sign of his imminent return. Request the free booklet, Why Natural Disasters, so that you can discern the signs of the times. To order our free booklet, email your request to td at kpcg.fm. From the Philadelphia Church of God campus in Edstone, England, this is the Trumpet Daily Program with Stephen Flurry. Victor Davis uh, Hansen, he had a piece uh, the other day saying that Iran deeply erred in thinking that Trump's restraint was permanent, that his impeachment meant he had lost uh, political viability. I think someone asked a Secretary of State Pompeo yesterday if uh, in the impeachment undermines the president's ability to act abroad. And uh, Pompeo said, well, maybe you should go ask Soleimani. <laughs> it hasn't slowed the Trump administration down or taken away from its ability to act. It says here that he would go dormant in an election year, that the stature of his left-wing opponents would surge in such tensions, and that his base would abandon him if he dared to use military force. You know, Iran, in other words, made a big mistake thinking these things. Hansen says, we are now in an election year. Iran yearns, listen to this, Iran yearns for a return of the U.S. foreign policy of John Kerry, Ben Rhodes, Susan Rice, and Samantha Power. They know how much they were able to, to accomplish, how many gains they made by that nuclear deal, all the money they were swimming in, piles and piles of cash. And, well, you saw the reaction on Friday of all the Obama people. They came out in a hurry saying how wrong this was to take out Soleimani and how everything was just going fantastic until Donald Trump came along. That's their view. Listen to Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and what he said about correcting all of the wrongs from the past 10 years. Clip two. We suffered from eight years of Iranian support from America. We gave them billions of dollars. We gave them resources. We allowed countries to trade with them, to build up their economy. What we are now having to correct for is the enormous economic activity that took place during this Iranian nuclear deal that President Trump rightly got out of in May of 2018. It's taken a little bit of time, and it will continue to take time, but we are going to restore deterrence. We, we just had a big hill to climb up, Chuck. Uh, we'd seen hundreds of thousands of people killed in Syria. Millions have to depart the region. We'd seen Le Lebanese Hezbollah, Hamas, the PIJ in Gaza Strip. All of these terror organizations, the Shia militias, the Shia militias that we are now yep. challenged to push back against today, all underwritten by American policy in the Obama administration. We've flipped the switch. We're draining those resources. And we're going to protect in America and keep American people safe. I'm sure. That's the Secretary of State on, uh, on Sunday, yesterday, talking about <laughs> a very clear change in direction, as my father put it, back in uh, May of 2018. A clear change. They're, they're going to return to establishing deterrence. They've flipped the switch. We've suffered through eight years of Obama. We suffered. We've suffered through that administration as it bribed its way 
or used bribery to bring Iran to the negotiating table, it is a very different direction that we're seeing for the United States uh, right now. That was uh, on, what was that, Chuck Todd's program. Here's, here's what the Secretary of State said on Jake Tapper's show yesterday as well. He was making the rounds, uh, Mr. Pompeo, clip three. Jake, we're trying to restore deterrence that, uh, frankly, uh, is a need that results directly from the fact that the previous administration left us in a terrible place with respect to the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, Team Obama appeased Iran, and it led to Shia militias with money, Hamas, the PIJ, hundreds of thousands of Syrians killed by Soleimani himself. Uh, this was the place we found ourselves when we came in, and we have developed a strategy to attempt to convince the Iranian regime to behave like a normal nation. So two very different approaches, for sure. And the Obama people are not going to go down easy. That's why you saw them in full force on Friday. They've got to get out there and get their narrative reinserted into the story here. And they have a lot of allies in the media, as we well know. But when you think about, again, this war between the Antiochus camp and the Jeroboam camp, it's ongoing. The impeachments, is, it's all part of it. The uh, Al Green, he's the guy that um, said that we've got to impeach him or else he might get uh, reelected, and he's gotten a lot of criticism for that from conservatives who basically point to his statement saying that you wanted to impeach him from the beginning even if you couldn't find any evidence. You were just going to go and find it. Find something to pin on Don uh, Donald Trump. So he was on a show recently and was asked about this statement that he made a year, year and a half ago, and he basically doubled down <laughs> on that statement. This is clip seven. Well, the genesis of impeachment, to be very candid with you, was um, when the, the president was running for office. When he was running for office. So when he came down the escalator in the summer of 2015, and, and Mr. Green there, he bases it on criticism. He was in the, the middle of a campaign against other Republicans at the time. And, of course, at that time, there were Republicans that were quite critical of, uh, of then— uh, not president-elect, but, but the campaigner, Donald Trump, running for president. He went head-to-head -head with Ted Cruz, and Lindsey Graham, of course, was quite critical of him. And this is what Al Green bases it on. Well, those people criticized him. They knew he was, they knew he was evil back then. So the, the impeachment goes back to that. The genesis of the impeachment. Forget about the Ukrainian call. Forget about uh, the Mueller investigation. Forget about obstruction of justice. We knew this man had to go before he was even elected. And so you have this ongoing war. Listen to what Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said recently uh, during a podcast. Uh, this is clip four. I'll be straight up with you. You have, you have folks who served in, the, that served in the previous administration who are telling the Iranian leaders today just hang on. President Trump will lose in the election in November, and we'll go back to appeasement. We'll write, the America will write you a big check. We'll, we'll underwrite your terror campaign around the world. We'll give you a clear pathway to a nuclear weapon system. Just wait till the Trump administration is finished. People in the previous administration, says the Secretary of State, who are telling the Iranian leaders today they're working to undermine President Trump's foreign policy today. That's astounding. That's a war. They're trying to destroy him any way that they can. John Kerry, really, he's made no bones about it as he's gone out and reestablished those contacts that he had with people uh, when he was Secretary of State. Working actively against this president. Really, what does it say when some of the comments that you hear coming out of Tehran, coming from the mullahs, coming from the Ayatollah, they sound, they, they sound very similar to some of the president's harshest critics in the United States, even in the media, the celebrities, all those people, like the, the comedian that joked uh, on the $80 million bounty. He said, well, we'll do it for half that. 
This is an American comedian who's making statements that really they align more with the mullahs than they do the, their own president. And that's where we are today in the deep, deep, divided state that we're in. A house divided, divided against itself. This is from Andy McCarthy's piece. It says it is, well, he talks about some of the lead up to the attack last week and how that, uh, well, the president warned the Iranians that they'd have to pay a very big price if they damaged the embassy or if they if they uh, killed any Americans. And Iran's supreme leader, the Ayatollah, he scoffed in reply. He says, you can't do anything. That's what he said last week before Soleimani was taken out. As McCarthy says, he might want to rethink that position. McCarthy concludes his piece by saying, it is worth bearing in mind that an attack on another uh, nation's embassy is by itself an act of war. It's an act of war because that's American property. That's American soil. It's an act of war. And it says, of course, Iran has done far worse, and Soleimani has been at the center of all of it for decades. Our government estimates that he was responsible for the killing of more than 600 troops during the fighting in Iraq. So he's killed 600 U.S. troops. Here he unleashed this this attack on the, the embassy in Baghdad. He wanted another 1979 siege. He wanted hostages. He wanted the United States to turn tail and run. McCarthy says the strategies of Trump's predecessors were to hope that a committed jihadist enemy would come to its senses, hope that it would realize its purported interest in regional stability, and hope that by bribing it with billions of dollars in sanctions relief, ransom, and an industrial strength nuclear program, we could de-escalate the conflict. It says President Trump's strategy, here's the the clear change in direction. President Trump's strategy is to remove the enemy's most effective military asset who will not be easily replaceable. That's speaking of Soleimani. It's a devastating blow. They'll come back. (laughs) They'll come back from it. We know that from Bible prophecy. But it says here, to remove the enemy's most effective military asset, to demonstrate to the mullahs what can happen when resolve backs our exponentially superior capabilities, and to continue squeezing the regime with punishing economic sanctions as it is pressured by the increasingly restive Iranian people. Those are two very different approaches (laughs) to dealing with Iran. And here you have these Obama people. They're still working. They're still working behind the scenes to try to thwart this administration, to try to prevent this this administration from carrying out its policies, its agenda. That will not go away anytime soon. I mentioned, uh, I believe it was on Friday's show, how that this article in the National Interest Uh, about how that the founders, the U.S. founders, they never wanted an unaccountable deep state. I was reading a a little section from a book on Thomas Jefferson yesterday afternoon, and it was at the part in 19 or 1776 where he was uh, authoring the Declaration of Independence. So it was just talking about the formation of the United States, and of course the Constitution came along years later. But even even I read through a good bit of the... uh, the Declaration. It's not that long of a document, and it, it's amazing to me just reading that, that history, and then knowing what was established later with the three branches of government, and then thinking about what the United States government has become. I mean, so much of what we were protesting against in the Declaration of Independence, it would apply to the size, just the enormity of the government today and all of its power and its, and its ability to oppress regular, ordinary Americans. One wonders what they would think, those founders, about a department of of justice or education or a federal bureau of investigation. 
or a central intelligence agency. Uh, they've all served their purpose, I suppose, to some degree. There's always some good that, that comes with it as well. But there's lots and lots of bad that goes with it. Fukuyama, that, that uh, philosopher who said that in a recent essay that, that we need the deep state in order to uh, fight against corruption and uphold the rule of law, as if the deep state is there to, to protect the United States from a president they don't like. And that national interest piece says it's exactly the opposite. It's exactly the opposite of the way it, it, uh, it is. Well, that's all that we have time for today. Tomorrow, I hope to get into a study about uh, human nature, just uh, uh, building on something that uh, we discussed a few weeks ago with comments made by uh, a congresswoman. But, but we'll have to save some of that. I had a little bit of that today, but we'll save it for tomorrow. You're listening to Stephen Flurry, and this is the Trumpet Daily Radio Show. If you'd like to email the program, you can send comments to td at kpcg.fm. Thank you for joining us. See you tomorrow.